Score, the podcast. The only show taking you inside the studios of the world's most celebrated composers and musical storytellers. I'm Kenny Holmes. He's Robert Kraft. I am. Another week, and uh, this is a huge episode for the show. We have an Oscar, Golden Globe, and Grammy-winning composer, Justin Hurwitz, who you know from First Man, La La Land, Whiplash. Uh, of course, he's Damien Chazelle's partner in crime. You go way back with these guys. Oh, I, I actually, it's funny you mentioned those three. I first met Damien and Justin on a picture they sent me when they were still in college called Guy and Madeline on a park bench. Mm. And I thought, not only did I think, how is it possible they're making this movie while college students, but... Also, it was about a really cool musician, and I thought, they're just in my zone. So I've I've been fans ever since they were undergraduates, and now I can't deny there's a little bit of pride seeing them just become yeah. the titans that they are. A lot to talk to about with uh, Justin Hurwitz coming up in just a bit. But first, for our special summer movie preview, mm. we're joined by the film critic who spent many years with Access Hollywood. He's co-founder and president of the Los Angeles Online Film Critics Society. He's the go-to host for Q&A screenings, w- whether it be in Hollywood or all the huge film festivals. And he's also not shy about being the biggest La La Land fan in the world. He's Huge. Scott Mance. Huge La La Scott Land Scott Movie fan. Mance. Thank you so much for having me on the show. And you know what? Over the course of my 20 years reviewing movies and for the 17 years that I was with Access Hollywood, you know, there have been movies like independent movies that I really did get behind and champion. I remember like the first time I saw Lost in Translation back in Mm -hmm. 2003. Beautiful film. And then Slumdog Millionaire was another one. But no movie, no movie... Uh, really just got to my heart and soul for so many reasons the way that La La Land did. I just thought it was a beautiful film, just a, a, an amazing fusion fusion of past and present. Mm. It was a tribute to the old Hollywood musicals, but it was still very current and contemporary. It was ambitious in the way that the, uh, the dance numbers, the musical numbers were filmed, full body, complete takes. But then, of course, there's the music and the score by Oscar winner Justin Hurwitz. Yeah. Uh, the music itself uh, performed by you know Ryan and Emma, but uh, Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone. But the score it just really sticks out, and I I could not talk about that movie enough. I could not champion that movie enough. <laughs> I still get people on social me- social media, Twitter, uh, tweeting me like if I love a film, they'll go, "Oh, was it as good as La La Land?" Uh, yeah, that's but great. you know, I, I, it's a badge of honor, and I wear it proudly. Well, well we, speaking of La La Land and the score, uh, we, we're going to do a special giveaway through Scott Mance's Twitter account at Movie Mance. Uh, Justin Hurwitz was nice enough to sign the soundtrack of La La Land, and we're going to be giving that away this week. So make sure to go over to our Twitter page, at Score the Podcast, and you can find how to enter. Basically, you just follow us, like and retweet. It's really easy, and someone's going to walk away with that uh, soundtrack. Robert, what are you, you're looking at it over I'm there. looking at it. It's a beautiful, here, it's signed in gold by Justin Hurwitz. Just this like the lovely. Oscar. This would be a lovely lovely thing to not only have in your collection but maybe even to to win and give someone as a gift oh, let, cool let me just thing. mention one other one other thing about uh, scott mance he's also the brother you wish you had because he gave his brother one of his kidneys oh, in 2015. How did you know that? oh we research on this show oh man isn't yeah. that incredible wow wow, wow. and you know what mm-hmm. uh, it was recently my brother's birthday mm. and uh you know ever since that happened in 2015 uh, every birthday that that both of us have are 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 more special and you know uh, just an update on his health he is he's doing great he feels better than he ever has we Fantastic. were a perfect match and oh, and thank you for bringing that up my friend oh I no problem that. So nice. I, that actually helps because I always thought that show business was the most important thing in the world but you might have reminded me that maybe brotherly love family and family ah it's gonna be a Toss up that between, deserves between show business. And, <laughs> Thank you so family, much. I appreciate that. That's so nice. Uh, let's jump into a couple quick topics before we get into Scott's summer movie preview. The Sonic the Hedgehog trailer came out this week. Of life changing. It's going to be scored by Junkie XL, which I'm very excited about what he's going to do with it. Um, the trailer 
a, a strange decision. It caught my attention. Uh, it had Coolio's Gangster's Paradise spliced all through it, which I don't know how those match up. Clearly, their their target audience is people in their 30s. When they're doing a trailer, Robert, I was going to ask you about this. Who makes those decisions? Because that's kind of a strange decision. It's nowhere near what Junkie XL's score is going to sound like. So who who picks Coolio's Gangster's Paradise, and does the, the composer have any say on that? Those are easy questions to answer. It's picked by the head of marketing at the studio. The composer finds out about it by flipping channels late at night and sees a trailer for a movie he's just spent six months working on every single eighth note, and the advertisement for it has Gangster's Paradise by Coolio (laughs) on it. Um, This has gone horribly wrong, in my experience. I actually have promised, or the studio absolutely firmly promised a rock star that if there was a trailer for the film it would feature his music that was an ironclad promise that i made to one of our greatest rock stars uh mr tom petty and mr tom petty was out on tour and was flipping channels and saw a trailer for a movie that he had just written the music and the songs for and in the trailer was mustang sally by wilson pickett and he called the next morning and said what the heck is that (laughs) (laughs) i think you just said the nice version yeah Yeah, and it wasn't tom who was a wonderful guy it was his manager saying we had a deal and i had to go into the marketing department to say excuse me whose idea was this you know and we know so marketing departments try and find any way to get to an audience and they make those decisions, and they never consult the composer. So, And as Henry Jackman would say, you sometimes want to strangle people. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. It's curious that they use Gangster's Paradise because often that's number three on the go-to. Tell me how many movies have, I'm walking on sunshine. Oh, yeah, there's a couple. There's that. Or Mustang things. Sally, strangely enough. Or those Free are- Fallen. Free fall. Yeah, I hear free fall a lot. (laughs) So they license those, and they think this will be a shortcut to our audience. Um, Let's get to it. Scott Mance. Yeah. It's summer movie time, and it already got off with a bang with uh, Avengers Endgame. It's not really a summer movie, so to speak, because it's spring, but... um, What are you excited about? Well, well, since you brought up Avengers Endgame, it didn't just start off the summer with a bang. (laughs) It started off the summer with the bang. The highest, biggest (laughs) opening, just like that score right there. The biggest opening of all time. $1.2 billion worldwide in the first five days of release, which is insane. Incredible. Um, But, you know, this is a movie that deserves that deserves every dollar, every penny it got, because I got to tell you, I thought the movie was absolutely fantastic. It mm-hmm. exceeded all my hopes and dreams and expectations, exceeded them all over and over again for so many reasons. Really in a, a, an amazing accomplishment culminating the 11-year, 22-film journey of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, a, a bold and ambitious undertaking by Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige, the likes of which – Hollywood movie making has ever seen but what really stuck out to me from that movie was the score beautiful score unforgettable score career best score at least one of them for the amazing Alan Silvestri the score for that movie brought it, it was epic and big and spectacular when it needed to be and it brought the feels when it needed to be and it was the perfect sort of emotional cues that accentuated what you were already feeling versus uh, manipulating your feelings. It's a very, very, very tricky thing for a composer to do, which is to sort of like like jump on the feeling that you have and accentuate it versus like be a button pusher. But Alan Silvestri's score for that movie, you know, when I think of like his greatest scores, you know, whether it's like, you know, Back to the Future, Mm -hmm. uh, which is probably one of my all-time favorites, um, you know, this is really, really up there and absolutely deserving of a nomination next year's Oscars. One of many, one of many, by the way, that Avengers Endgame is going to get because if Black Panther can almost go the distance for Best Picture, I think that because of what Endgame represents, uh, you're looking at a a deserving, I mean, it's too early to call it, let's face it, Hmm. but it's certainly deserving of a nomination for Best Picture, and it is deserving, I'm not calling it, but is deserving of a win 
Just like Return of the King won for all three Lord of the Rings movies, Avengers Endgame could win. It's deserving to win Best Picture for the culmination of 22 movies in the MCU. Again, I'm not calling it. Wait a second. Scott Mance going on record saying Sylvester is winning the Oscar for uh, Best Score? Uh, well, why he's, I think he's going to get nominated. Oh, okay. 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 I All definitely right. think he'll get nominated. I got nominated. a little excited. You know, I, I actually have had the privilege of working with Alan. He is so deserving. He's so brilliant. You know, he doesn't have an Oscar. He was nominated for a picture that we worked on, and he wrote one cue for the movie. What and was it, it? It's a real, this is a, like a trivia question that'd be, it was Castaway. Oh, Castaway. And he wrote the end title cue. You know, of course, when... Tom Hanks and Wilson, the, Get off the, the ball, are out in the wilds there. There's, There's no, no music, music. No music. And then he comes back, and there he is with Helen Hunt. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And there's an incredible cue that takes you to the end of the movie, and he was nominated for the cue. The, when he gets off the island with the ball, with Wilson, and he's on the raft, and he looks back on the island, and it sort of disappears into a rain cloud. Yeah. Like, that's when the score kicks back in, and that right. motif plays throughout the rest of the film, and it is beautiful. Alan Silvestri is just, I mean, he's really up there with, like, John Williams. Oh, he is. And Jerry Goldsmith as one of the great all-time mm-hmm. modern film composers. And by the way, Wilson got snubbed on Best Supporting Actor, but let's move on. Yeah. Oh, poor uh, Wilson. All right. Scott. Yeah. Movies that are up Coming ahead. Out. Okay, well, s- staying on the superhero track here, uh, y- you know, one of my all-time, well, my all-time favorite superhero, because of, I've been reading the comics since I was a little, little kid, is Spider-Man. And I loved uh, Spider-Man Homecoming with Tom Holland. It came out in 2017, directed by John Watts. Mm-hmm. Score, great movie. It's a great movie. A score by the amazing Oscar-winning composer Michael Giacchino. Won the Academy Award for 2009's Up. He also did great, great scores for the three rebooted Star Trek movies You know that take place in the Kelvin timeline. He did amazing work recalling the likes of Jerry Goldsmith when he did the scores for Dawn of the Planet of the Apes mm-hmm. and War for the Planet of the Apes. And uh, he did Star Wars Rogue One. And, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the amazing thing about Spider-Man is after the first movie came out in 2003 and you had the three movies with Toby, then you had the two movies with Andrew Garfield, and now you're doing uh, the, the Tom Holland version. In between these two films, Homecoming and Far From Home, which opens on July 2nd, uh, you have this animated film called Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, yes. which won, deservingly, the Oscar for Best Animated Feature and should Loved have it. won. It should have been nominated for Best Picture. Oh, no it was question. the best movie of 2018. It really was. But uh, Far From Home is, is going to be great because finally we'll see the live-action version of one of Spider-Man's deadliest foes, a villain who goes back to June of 1964 with Amazing Spider-Man number 13, his first appearance in that issue, and played by Jake Gyllenhaal is Mysterio. Ooh. Mysterio is going to be great because the character – uh, it originated back in the in the in the early '60s. Was uh, a master of illusion who worked in show business in special effects. Mm. So now here's his character, the character Mysterio, in a movie that is going to be very heavy on special effects. I mean, I think that's a great match. It's I love lead it. Lead to a lot of fun. And again, Michael Giacchino can do no wrong in my eyes. He is amazing. I still you gotta cry. get him on the show. I still cry when when uh, Giacchino's score for Up plays. Oh, the first nine uh, minutes oh. of that dun, movie. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, it's beautiful. It's too much. And Inside Out, he did. It's a great. He's just the best. We can't forget Family Stone. It's a little one. Oh, Family Stone. Oh, 2005 that came out. Very good. Michael yes. did it. <laughs> Next up. Next up. Well, uh, not going in particular order here, but staying on this, the subject of Oscar winning composers, this next one is composed by the amazing Oscar winning composer Hans Zimmer. Mm-hmm. But unlike Giacchino for Spider-Man Far From Home, Hans Zimmer is going to do the score for a live-action version of the animated movie for which he won an Academy Award for Best best Score. And that is, of course, you know where I'm going with this, fellas. Yeah. Lion it King. the Lion King. I'm so pumped to watch this. It yeah. looks incredible. This movie's directed by John Favreau. 
who also did an animated to live action version with the the Jungle Book, which was a great version. And then you had, you know, uh, in 2017, you had the live action version of Beauty and the Beast, Mm -hmm. which also did very, very well. But, you know, I feel like uh, Disney is in danger of going to the well one too many times with doing live action versions of their animated classics. Yeah, unfortunately, they're only going to make 900 million as opposed to a billion. (laughs) Well, Dumbo did not do that well. Uh, And Dumbo wasn't really that great. Yeah, it didn't do that well. And, And the jury is still out um, on it, on whether or not this is an experiment that's going to reap rewards. But I think Lion King, I Everybody think you're okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, just the footage that we've uh, been able to see, I mean, the story it looks like it's very much uh, almost a live action shot for shot remake yes. of the original. Uh, the trailer film. absolutely was shot for shot. Yeah. It's yep. interesting to point out, too, that The Lion King doesn't have any like human characters intertwined, whereas, whereas like Jungle Aladdin. Or Jungle Book, right? Uh, Jungle Book was fantastic. I'm I'm excited about Aladdin, but I'm not sure. There's a lot of skeptics with Will Smith trying to reprise the. Also, uh, it's it's not just Will Genie. Smith. He, you know, I mean, Guy Ritchie directing a family musical, the director of Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, and Snatch. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's an interest. It's not it's not a. Slam I'm gonna dog. go see it though. Yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm definitely gonna see it. Aladdin but, was my favorite Disney movie. So, but um, but Hans Zimmer is you know an amazing amazing composer. You know, he he uh, also was Oscar nominee for for you know Gladiator. He did the scores for the Dark Knight trilogy. You know he's he's also one of the very very greatest composers working today. Yeah. Uh, and now another another film really looking forward to just because you know the original first movie in the series changed the game for animated movies mm-hmm. back in 1995 for being the first full length feature computer animated film, the first Toy Story. Mm. You know Pixar. You know, is 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 what it is because of that first movie. Yeah, and that all, launched the company. It really did. And also, you know, all three Toy Story movies are great. The first one was great. Toy Story 2 from 1999 was even better. And Toy Story 3, which won the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, but was nominated for Best Picture 2010. That was the best of the three. So now now we have nine years later, Toy Story 4. Composer, of course, he's back. You got a friend in Randy Newman. Yes. You know, and just they showed the first 17 minutes of Toy Story 4 at CinemaCon, yeah. the theater owner's convention in Las Vegas. And it was a big surprise when they did that. But uh, if the rest of the movie is like the first 17 minutes that they showed, Toy Story 4 is going to be just like the rest of them. Great. It's an all audience movie. Just who wouldn't want to go see that? Who wouldn't? Right. And do you know how many people have grown up watching the Toy Story films? Do you know how many grown ups are now taking their kids to see Toy Story 3 and will take teenagers to see Toy Story 4? It's, it's, it's a beautiful the thing. Generations, it's a beautiful yeah. thing. Yep. All uh, right. I think we have time for one more. One more. If I was going to pick one more yesterday. Uh, yesterday is the Danny Boyle directed Richard Curtis. I can't wait for this. One. I can't wait for such yesterday. An interesting idea for a movie. It is an it's such an interesting idea that you go. Why didn't they think about this before? It's, so the it's premise, nice to have an original something coming out. Too. Yes, everything that we're watching and and seeing release is reboots, and right. we already know the story. It's nice to see a trailer for something and go. Well, that's original. Well, I love the idea. Well, long story short, long story short about the pitch. So this guy, he's a struggling musician, you know, aspiring musician, is really just uh, down on his luck. And just there's some world cataclysmic thing that happens in a split second. And he's immune to what happens, but everyone else in the world doesn't nobody remembers the Beatles. Nobody remembers the names of the Beatles or any of the songs. Nobody remembers any of them. It's like the Men in Black memory eraser. For the entire world, no one remembers the Beatles. But it's still the current day. It's still present day. And everything is still very much as it is now, which is, which is striking to me because the Beatles did more than change music. They changed everything. everything. So I'm curious to see how that plays out. But then when he starts, but he realizes that nobody remembers the Beatles. And he starts but playing him. the songs on his guitar, and he starts playing Yesterday, and I Want to Hold Your Hand, and Help, and All You Need Is Love. You know, people like like Beatlemania strikes in 2019, and this guy becomes a massive, massive sensation. And it's like, well, if nobody remembers the Beatles. Is he really ripping off or doing any uh, 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 any, any fraud here? But it, you know, listen, Danny Boyle, 
never makes the same movie twice. You know, this is the director of Train Spotting. This is the Oscar winning director of Slumdog Millionaire. Yep. And Richard Curtis, who who wrote and directed like, you know, Love Actually. Yeah. He's actually a huge, huge Beatles fan. Massive Beatles fan. He always puts some kind of Beatles reference into his movies. Um and I, I, I agree with you, Kenny. I mean, in, in, a, in a summer when we are full of sequels and reboots and, and sequels of reboots and <laughs> movies based on comic book characters and, and all the stuff, which and I love those movies, but there's nothing like a good original film to really uh, capture everyone. And this could be it. This is going to be a big sleeper hit. I know it now. And oh, it's so nice. It's scored by Daniel Pemberton, who did Spider Verse. Yeah. Well, bingo. Bingo. <laughs> Daniel Pemberton. Calling Daniel Pemberton, we would love to have you on the show. And so, I, I think uh, Scott's such fans. maybe a little extra excited about that movie as uh, his watch says the Beatles on it. Huge. He, he's a I'm diehard. A huge Beatles fan. Love the Beatles. Who's your favorite Beatle? Real fast. McCartney. McCartney. Yeah, me too. Well, since I saw him a week ago, I'm not kidding. You saw him a week ago? I saw Paul McCartney oh. in a restaurant. Nice. It was the week between Coachella's. Oh, he was in cool. L.A. I was in a restaurant. I was having lunch, and I said to somebody, "Don't turn around now, but you're about to lose your mind." Did you uh-huh. do the old like take a picture of your friend, but really you're taking picture of your friend's ear and Paul McCartney behind them? I didn't them? do anything except admire how great he looked. Yeah, he's how amazing. calm he was. How people left him alone, which I nice. found amazing. That's very cool. And I actually had the thought, speaking of yesterday, and we will close with this. I thought, here's a man walking to his table. Everyone in this room, everyone on the block that we're on, everyone in the city that we're in can go, yesterday. And he wrote it. Mm -hmm. Everyone. There's hardly a human. Maybe somebody who's at Cedar sinai Hospital a week old right now might have trouble. But I think if you're eight. No, their their mom probably played it through the womb. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So I thought... This guy's walking across the restaurant. He wrote songs that the entire world, six billion people know. Oh, my God. I saw Paul. I have seen Paul McCartney in concert 22 times. Oh, you're lucky. Number 23 is coming on July 13th at Dodger Stadium. Nice. Where the Beatles played their second to the last ever live paying concert on August 28th, 1966. Paul McCartney at July 13th. Yes, sir. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Well, like I said, Scott Movie Mance is is a wealth of knowledge. Uh, if you don't follow him on Twitter, I the first mention I got that Avengers broke the records they did was from Scott Mance's nice. Twitter account. All right. <laughs> so uh, if you're not following him, he's he's where the go to for uh, your movie information. We want to thank Scott for oh, thank coming you. on the show. Thank you both, gentlemen, fellas. This is great. A quick reminder: go to our Twitter at Score the Podcast. We're giving away this La La Land soundtrack signed by the maestro himself, Justin Hurwitz. He's up next after the break. Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. What about strange lands and escape from the everyday? It's brilliant, George. Before anyone knew them by name. Who's a good boy, Indiana? 400 grand? Let me explain it. George, that's our money. Blockbuster. Everybody, take cover! Following the spectacular failures. Sir, sir, are you all right? And the unexpected triumphs. Can you believe it? I told you, George. I told you. A six-part immersive audio series. Blockbuster. Subscribe now on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and all other platforms. Hey, Score fans, it's Robert Kraft. We're back to the show in 25 seconds. If you like what you're hearing, do us a quick favor. Rate and review the show on your favorite podcast platform. It just takes a second, and it helps the show grow. Hey, thanks. We're going back to the show right now. Welcome back. We're here with two-time Oscar winner, three-time Golden Globe winner, two Grammys. Justin, thanks so much for being on Score, the podcast. Thank thank you for having me. The studio audience clearly feels strongly. I know that Guy and Madeline on a Park Bench was Damien Chazelle's first picture. Mm -hmm. You worked on it. Mm -hmm. That movie was shown to me when you were an undergraduate. And Damien was. Damien sent me a clip. I loved it. And I don't remember. Did we talk a thousand years ago? I don't remember you watching it. You may have. I remember we sent you, I guess it was Damien was maybe the one who sent you a a demo of some music. And I had no, 
like DAW capability back then. Um, people had been telling me you need to learn Logic or Cubase or one of those, and I just resisted. I was just into uh, doing it the way I was doing it at the time, which was composing on the piano and then orchestrating in finale. This is all while you're in college. While while we were in college, and we hadn't had the we hadn't gotten the music recorded yet. Later on, we we raised by which I mean begged everybody for <laughs> enough money to go get like one session with the Bratislava Symphony. So later later on we got it recorded by I didn't know that. Yeah, that was later on we got it recorded, but by the time when we sent it to you, it was it was just a MIDI demo and like I said because I didn't know logic or any of that, it was the MIDI that Finale spits out, mm, which is swinging. Really really basic sort of samples <laughs> and it sounded fine to us. I mean, that's what we were listening to and judging the music by at the time. Um and we sent it to you and you had nothing good or bad to say. All you said is never send a demo like this to anybody. This is not for other people's ears. That's so <laughs> funny. I first of all, I don't remember that. I mean, this is I'm now, you know, frankly, you're college students. I'm head of music at Twenty Century <laughs> Fox. I'm being slightly generous and slightly stern when I reply to you that way, saying the most gentle way of saying NFW. <laughs> I think as the years pass, I've become less adept at being finesseful. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's interesting. That might have been right there on the bubble of never send anybody. Um, well, you were right. I mean, you weren't wrong at all. I, I, I should have. And I later on realized, oh, I have to learn how to use uh, real, real samples and play in and make proper mock-ups and proper demos but i wasn't there yet i was um so we, we and we didn't we didn't really that's what we were used to and we were sort of trying to just trust that okay we'll get it played and it'll sound fine and these are this is just a very rough approximation we weren't thinking about what is really presentable to other people it was just part it was between us really it was it was how damien and i were working and 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 we hadn't thought about we need things to present because we weren't working with there weren't really producers. There wasn't a studio. There weren't like um, approvals. There, there weren't like other people we had to show stuff to. So we were just doing it between ourselves, and it, and it seemed fine for us. But then we thought, oh, this uh, Robert Kraft guy, we should send something to him. And then suddenly, yeah, you do need then you do need something that sounds good enough for other people's it's, ears. And and what we sent definitely was not good enough for other people's ears. It's really, first of all, I kind of wish I had a time machine and could go back to that second where either you called Damien or Damien called you or you were both at a computer and went, oh, shit, you see this <laughs> email from Robert Kraft? Um, oops. It's over. <laughs> but I also think you actually just identified a really interesting moment in the creative process, which is we all get kind of entranced with what we're looking at and we have a vision in our head of what it could be and would be. I mean, I run into this all the time with demos, with people sending rough edits of things and they, in their head, they know what this, wait, when the costumes and it's lit and all that. And you look at it as an outsider and say, this is kind of amateur and, and kind of untogether. And it's, it's hard to f understand that unless you have an incredibly intuitive watcher and listener, mm -hmm. or you've spent so much money, you just have to hope that they're going to get to the next level. It's also why in the composing field these days, composers no longer do, here's a piano demo. Mm -hmm. I mean, now you go to certain composers for for them to score a film, and you hear the complete score. Yeah, an entire mock-up. Mock up yeah. Before they get there. Tell me... I don't think I know how you and Damien met. I don't know. And here's this wonderful collaboration. Damien Chazelle, of course, the director, your partner in crime of yeah. all your movies. Yeah. First Man, La La Land, Whiplash. Yeah. Guy and Madeline. Guy, Guy and Madeline. Madeline. Yep. Um, we, we met first week of freshman year of, of college. Um, I, for some reason, thought I should be in a band. I thought that was the thing to do. I mean, I... I I was I went to study composition and I wanted to be a film composer, but I got also the idea of well being in a band would be fun. So I I was going around asking everybody 
um, in the freshman class, are you a musician or do you know a musician? <laughs> I was just trying to meet musicians to start a band with. And um, I got this tip that there's this guy, somebody said there's this guy in my dorm named Damien Chazelle. He was like one of the best jazz drummers in the country, best high school jazz drummers in the country. Um, he won all these competitions in high school and you should meet him. So I just called him up cold and I said he picked up his phone. If he hadn't picked up that first call, maybe we never would have met. I don't know if I would have tried him back, but um, he picked up and I introduced myself and said I was looking to start a band and I had found a couple of other people. I think there was a guitarist and a bass player who wanted to play and um, and he, he was up for it. So we got together and we played and we did start the band. Um, and you did, what, what did you play? I played piano, keyboard. Uh, I played like a Fender Rhodes some of the time, like a piano some of the time. What was the name of the band? It's called Chester French. Oh, you're in Chester French. That's right. That's how D.A. Wallach yeah. ends up in the movie. Yeah, D.A. plays the 80s <laughs> singer in the movie right. um, in La La Land. Um, I, so we were in it. Damien and I were in it before Chester French became anything that people would know. Basically, the short version of it is we were in the band. Um, we took it really seriously for about a year. Then some uh, in, during sophomore year, Damien and I both quit the band around the same time just to focus on movies. I mean, we had, like I said, wanted to – I had – been thinking that I wanted to be a film composer. He'd wanted to be a film director since he was a little kid. So we knew we wanted to do movies, and it just became clear sophomore year. This band is taking up so much time, and it's becoming less fun. We were all fighting with each other. You know, we were like, let's just, Damien and I were room, rooming together at that point. We decided to live together sophomore year, so we were like, let's just focus on movies. So we quit the band, and they kept going. The, the remaining guys kept going with it. And writing new songs and, and, and recording. And senior year, they, by themselves, with no agent, manager, lawyer, anything, they started a bidding war between all of the major labels. Um, Kanye West offered them their first deal. Then Pharrell wow. offered them a deal. And then all the major labels jumped in. And, and I remember we were still in school. We were seniors. And they were getting flown off every weekend be courted oh, no. by moguls they were going to like atlanta that one weekend and la the next weekend and then they were just going everywhere and coming back with like swag bags and oh, no. and and um how did you feel about that terrible terrible because <laughs> I, I think we, we all felt terrible we were like that was a huge that was our chance this that is was the next it. biopic move over <laughs> bohemian rhapsody <laughs> um it was really hard um because when you're in school or even for a while after school, those first years, uh, you know, you don't know what what you're doing if what you're doing is ever going to pay off. If your career is ever going to come from it, and this was our band, it had the same name. They had new songs. We had no stake in it really at any point, but it's, it still felt like our band. It was called the same thing, and it was two of the same guys. And they now had these big opportunities coming at them and it was really hard to not be a part Oof. of it were you going around going like you, you guys heard of that band I, <laughs> we started it just so you know <laughs> um former chester french yeah. member of, it was the t-shirt oh gee yeah i must say that probably at the minute that you were feeling the way that it is understandable that you felt which is oh did we take the wrong path mm -hmm. da and the other guy who's Ma name, max right came out to see me as well because mm -hmm. um, that's same college relationship and they came to 20th Century Fox to sort of introduce themselves and said during the meeting as I'm being probably not far away from never send a midi mm -hmm. thing well you know you guys when you graduate from college you probably have to move to L.A. and you have to make some more demos and you're going to have to kind of get a manager and an agent. I went through the whole shtick of what it takes to get a record deal and D.A. casually leans back on the couch and goes, well, it's funny, we were just with Kanye this <laughs> afternoon and um, we're seeing Jimmy Iovine uh, for dinner because Interscope really wants us. And I went, wait, what? <laughs> and it was exactly what you were yeah. saying, which is, and they hadn't told me how far along they were. Yeah. And I, I didn't even know whether to believe them. Yeah. I thought it was so cosmically unbelievable. Yeah. No, but P.S. The P.S. of the story is when you see La La Land, 
you will see the singer in Chester <laughs> French. The, the funny thing is that to the victor goes the spoils, and D.A. is a fabulous guy and incredibly talented um, and has had success in many other arenas. Yeah, so many things. I mean, he still does some music. He had uh, a solo deal at Harvest yep. Records, and but he's doing so much business and venture capital tech. stuff and uh, so, tech, yeah. lots of really cool um, tech and biomed stuff. He's... He's really very special. But he is, and unique. And if you want to know who we're talking about as we've tangented away, because <laughs> I think we go to the next one, um, DA has a cameo in La La Land as the singer in the 80s band that Ryan Gosling is playing keyboards in. And Emma Stone looks at Ryan Gosling and says, uh, huh. Yeah, cool. <laughs> um, and DA is singing. What is the song Take On Me? Take or? On Me yeah. and... Um, and I think there's a second, and I ran. And I ran by the haircut band of life. <laughs> so you and Damien hook up in college. You make this film. Where does the transition to Hollywood come from? And we were talking about it a little bit, but you're listed on IMDb as a writer for shows like Curb and The Simpsons. Like, Can you tell us about your transition to Hollywood and sort of how that all came about? Yeah. Um, well, we moved to LA um Damien moved I think in 2007 I moved in 2008 um just on a chance or was there a job uh no there was no there was no job um I had been we'd been sending stuff that we'd done to people I mean like that terrible MIDI demo to Robert (laughs) um and trying to get stuff going I should have written you this is fantastic (laughs) let's sign a lifetime deal (laughs) Um, so yeah, we, we tried to get as many, you know, relationships going over email and whatnot with people, but nothing really happens, I guess, until you move here and spend time doing nothing and trying to meet more people. And, um, yeah, so we moved out here and we were both doing, we both found other things to do. We had we had that movie Guy and Madeline that we were finishing and like I said, still trying to raise some money for. We ended up that first summer, um, I went over to Bratislava and did the one session for So that session wasn't remote, I'm sorry. No. So I you realize listeners of Score of the Podcast that you can hire orchestras sometimes out of the United States for less money and there are two ways to record them. Uh, one is remotely, which means you sit in a recording studio in Hollywood or New York or your basement, and somebody hooks them up with video and audio, and you record different time. You know, it's different time zones there in a whatever time zone it is in Bratislava and Eastern Europe. And you can you, outsource anything. Yep. <laughs> or you do what you did. Well, we didn't have a studio or anything, so it may have even been harder and more expensive to do. The oh, link. Wow. I don't even know, but. Um, I know that the plane tickets somehow were cheaper if I went for five days instead of just for the one or two days for the session. So I went earlier than I needed to be, stayed longer than I needed to be, um, and had all this time just to walk. But I was so jet lagged. So I was just like walking around Bratislava in the middle of the night, um, (laughs) waiting for the session that was like three days away. So, um, I went, it was one session. I think sessions there are like four hours. So it was like one session for the whole score and songs and which meant we get like one uh maybe two takes two takes of everything maybe three takes of a few things so it's like the first take was sight reading the second take you just had to keep it and move on and that was occasionally you get another take and that was it and um it was the first time that any of my orchestrations had ever been played by real players so I was learning very quickly what works and what doesn't work, but you only get two takes. So it was like, it was a crash course. Um, and it was the most, one of the most thrilling experiences of my life. I remember I was watching it from the booth being conducted and played and recorded and I was bouncing up and down. I was literally jumping on my, on my toes and the, the engineers were laughing at me. They, they, they had, they thought that was funny. They hadn't seen somebody so excited, but it was yeah to hear the stuff finally get played and come to life like that. It was so so exciting. Um, but there was also so much stuff that I, uh, aside from 
orchestration things that don't work and learning, oh, yeah, range things like, you you know, just because it's written in the book that, that, that they can hit that note doesn't mean they should or doesn't mean they should jump to that note from that. Or like, oh, yeah, the players have to breathe. I forgot that you need to leave spaces for them to breathe. There's so many, like, issues that I hadn't really thought about. Um, but then other things like... Um, it was so that movie was almost like a prototype for La La Land. It was, it was kind of um, a lot of the music was sort of a jazz rhythm section married to orchestrations, and playing it simultaneously. Yeah, playing it together, which I should have known not to not to do it that way. I should have known to do the Rhythm, jazz part. Rhythm date first. The rhythm first, definitely, and should have done that in America. Um, cause we'd been, we'd been doing, the movie had jazz in it and we'd been recording great, um, uh, uh, students at Berkeley and Boston and other Boston musicians. Um, so we had, we'd been working with great, great jazz players, but we had, we didn't think about, uh, doing the rhythm sections first in Boston and then going and layering the orchestrations over that. So I was trying to do it all together and which, you know, has, uh, issues just in terms of how it's engineered, but also I learned like they're really, really good orchestras over there in Bratislava, but they don't really have a jazz background. They have more of a classical romantic background. You're very, very polite, and <laughs> I've done dates there, and the idea of swinging, swinging is was problematic. A, swinging was a problem, and reading lead sheets was a problem. So I, I had charted it the way that I did La La Land years later, which is everything on the page except for, like, the bass and piano, which had changes yeah. and cer- some rhythmic things that they needed, but mostly chord changes. And they didn't know what to do with that. Um, and I think we had six bass players in the orchestra and none of them knew, none of them had a background in playing changes. So they're like, what is this? So during, it was a four hour session, like I said, for the, all the score and the songs. And we had like a one break or a break for the first a couple of breaks the first break i remember i had to write out all the quarters for them um like a walking bass i had to wa- write out the walking bass line um so that they could play That's that. so funny because you, you know an american musician is used to seeing c f f g mm-hmm. and just walking between them and playing the changes european musicians i know for a fact i mean i once was in prague and had a trumpet player needed to play a swinging trumpet line and he played it like a classical player which was beautiful but it just was so odd and we tried it several takes and it just didn't have a feel that we're yeah. used to in america yeah and um that combined with the fact that there was no time combined with the fact that i was so it was my first time recording so i didn't even know how to communicate changes to to them or to anything it was just like you do it you move on and we also never had it mixed so <laughs> it was it was just the basic uh however it came in is, is how you could always have used that midi file you sent to me oh, initially yeah. put that in the movie i think one of the things that's most impressive is that you were ambitious enough you and damien on your first movie that you made and funded through all these you know, band-aids and toothpicks and whatever holds the money together, that you thought it was important enough for that movie to get an orchestra date. Well, that was, it was, yeah, it ended, I think it was like $12,000 or something for the session, and, um, which is a lot of money it's for... a real hard cost for yeah, a movie. Students Absolutely. who are making a no-budget, um, essentially glorified student film. Um, but that was part of Damien's vision from the beginning. He said... The the one thing we really need to raise money for is the orchestra. Like that was part of his the aesthetic of the movie was it was going to be a sixteen millimeter black and white um, handheld sort of verite style movie that I was going to shoot with um, the cameras from school and the film stock from school and all that. But we need a lush orchestra. We need a real orchestra. And he said that that was part of what he wanted to do, marry that sort of like documentary style to sort of a, a lush romantic musical. And, um, and that was, that was amazing. It was, yeah, he wanted to combine these, these very different sort of styles. And that sort of grew in years later to La La Land again, wanting to do a musical, but have very grounded elements to it. Marry the grounded with the, the whimsical and tightened, parts of a musical so i think it's interesting that all these films that you're mentioning guy and madeline certainly whiplash la la land 
maybe not first man so much. They have musicians on camera, yeah. of course, in the scene. And we were talking about it yesterday. When a composer writes for a film that has a musician and a band on camera and all the, is the word diegetic? Mm-hmm. I get, always get that confused because I always think of it as on camera, not on camera. And you diegetic yeah. means what the audience can hear and what the characters like in can the hear. world of the movie, right? So the um, and there's also in the middle of that Francis Coppola's word "scorse," mm-hmm. which is you have a source cue, either it's being played live or it's on the radio, and it sort of drifts into becoming score as the scene cuts away from mm-hmm. actually looking at a tabletop radio to you know you're now in Central Park, but the same song is playing. That's called scorse. It's functioning as score. But when a drummer is at the center of your movie, do you think my score really needs to be around drums and rhythmic things because there's so much about drums? Or do you go the other way? How do you navigate that arena of the character as a a musician and how does that impact your score? Whiplash, we... We talked about a lot of different approaches to the score, and what we ended up deciding to do was to... um, We sort of threw out what it couldn't be. Couldn't be an orchestral score. That would be weird for that movie. Um, Couldn't be an electronic score. That would feel weird. It's a movie all about instruments and musicians. And so what we ended up coming to was, let's record, let's make a dramatic underscore out of big band instruments, but let's twist them and screw with them so that they become like a... um, kind of more of a surreal twisted version of a big band instrument so there it's it's made out of uh saxes and trumpets and trombones and bass and and drums and whatnot but a lot of it's been slowed down and detuned and um is that to create the discomfort of the movie yeah because it's 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 the movie's like a thriller like a horror movie a lot of the cues needed to be like that they need to just add this sort of um unnerving sort of tension and uncomfortable uncomfortable um yeah that's um, interesting you call it a horror film because jk simmons is quite terrifying in that movie yeah <laughs> i wondered on a musical film of course a composer has to be all involved in the on-screen music and i said you no. know what we're let's take a quick break and then we'll get to that, as i was going to say this is yeah. something I, we're going to talk about when we come back did we ever get the question answered about writing i don't think so did just your writing, I, I think before we take a break, you wrote some scripts. You're still writing scripts? No. 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 Um, yeah, we, we kind of uh, jumped over that part. So, yeah, we moved. Um, when we moved out to L.A., Damien and I were both doing other things. We were trying to we're finishing this movie, Guy and Madeline, try, trying to get other movies going, but we were doing other things um, to stay busy and paying the bills. So that's how I ended up um, doing uh, writing for some contributing to and then later writing some uh for some sitcoms did it impact your musical approach at all or do you feel they're really separate or your no. teamwork in the in the hollywood scene does being, that does that help you at all to work with a writing team and, and being part of the writer's room is it mm, no <laughs> and do you watch sitcoms now and say oh i really understand no <laughs> so it was an impactful uh, experience, and I think on that all note, future composers, if you're, you should start writing. <laughs> it, it plays a big role. It's very. I, I mean, it was. It was. I was very lucky to be able to do that as a, um, as a as a thing. Um, but it's not what I was passionate about. It's not what I moved out here to do. And um, it's. Um, I got. I, I was. I was. Got. St- very nice opportunities. People were very generous to me and gave me opportunities. Um, but it's not what I felt like I was meant to do. So I was just excited to once once I could start making my living composing. I was just excited. to Your do hunch that. was right, <laughs> and you never know. First of all, how wonderful to be capable and talented enough to actually do that. It's not every composer that can say, "Yeah, I'm going to spend a couple of days, you know, writing some big time network sitcoms." So that's pretty impressive, of course. But I also think you never know where that's going to come back. You just don't right. know how. Hey, listen, it might be that 
you end up working. It's good on, to have in the You arsenal. end up working on a film about a comedy writer, <laughs> and you can blow the whistle on any of the number of the scenes. That you say, mm, it's not <laughs> the way it works. Actually, I've been in those rooms. So, yeah, all right, we're that's... going to take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk La La Land and First Man. Much more with Justin Hurwitz when we return. Hey, Score fans, it's Kenny. Now that Season 2 is going strong, you can look good while you're listening. We just released the official Score the Podcast t-shirt. There's multiple colors and sizes for men, women, and children. And they're super soft. I just got a few myself. They fit really nice, and they feel great, and they look cool. Uh, so go to score-movie.com slash store. Check those out, and you can also get a copy of Score, a film music documentary on Blu-ray, and our uh, interview bonus disc that has the extended interviews from the film. So plenty to check out, score-movie.com slash store, and get your shirt today. Welcome back. We're here with Justin Hurwitz. We're lucky to be here with Justin Hurwitz. I think we're going to switch gears now and talk about your uh, last few years, big years, Oscar winning, Golden Globe winning, Grammy winning. That had to have been a pretty crazy experience for you to go through that whirlwind. Yeah, because, you know, the biggest challenge is which tuxedo to wear <laughs> to which event. As I said to you at one point, you know, you got to work on your speech, too. <laughs> you know, when you do a musical, big musical film, and I had worked on Moulin Rouge or Walk the Line, the jobs were separate. The film composer scored the movie. The on-camera musical scenes, we had a music supervisor or we had a music producer or we had somebody come in specifically to work on certainly choreography and singing stuff and... A lot of moving parts. A lot of moving parts. But I'm curious on La La Land how yeah. involved you were. Yeah, there was, there was a lot of um, pre-production work. I mean, I was... All phases, really, there was stuff for me to do. So... Um, there was the writing of the songs. There was the uh, um, I'd written the music. Went back and forth to Damien a lot to get those melodies right, to get the structure of the songs right. And then Passing and Paul wrote the lyrics, and we went back and forth many, many times with them after we had locked down what the melodies were and what the structures were. Then they would write many drafts of the lyric, and that was more Damien working with them in terms of what he wanted with the storytelling and all of of it. Um, and then um, we were in the studio a lot. So there were a couple of, um, music supervisor, producer, Steve Kazicki, and Mary Stavries, who, um, worked with us during pre-production, just bringing in demo singers every day to, to demo up the latest lyric from Pask and Paul to demo up, um, the latest vocal arrangements or, um, whatever it was. And we were just trying to build demos. Um, and were those demos, I mean, it's kind of a call back to the first bit of this podcast, those demos, you were now performing synthetic demos, but sophisticated synth demos of the orchestrations for the songs. How developed were the actual tracks that the demo singers were singing to? They were really developed. So this was, it was actually on La Land that I finally learned the basic things that I needed to know as a film composer, how to use a DAW. Um, and the way I ended up... Would you like to tell our listeners what a DAW <laughs> I think it's Digital Audio Workstation. Correct. Like Logic. Yep, D-A-W. Yep. Um, so basically, when we started the project, I didn't know how to use it. I was still doing it the way I'd always done it, which is uh, compose on the piano and orchestrate in finale. So those early demos, all the pre-production demos, we were making them essentially in reverse. Normally what composers do is they will kind of sketch or play in as, as thoroughly as they can into one of these pieces of software and then later it goes on the page it gets orchestrated but i was doing it in reverse so i was orchestrating it fully in finale every note every articulation every dynamic and then giving those orchestrations to marius um and his team who would just like extract the midi and put it into logic and assign the samples and assign the um, you know, draw in the dynamics and all that and try to make them as lifelike as possible. So it was kind of reverse. And, um, but it was over the course of doing that, like looking over Marius's shoulder and um, that I sort of saw how logic started working. So later, once we got to, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, once we got to post-production, I was doing the actual score, score, the underscore cues. Um he was gone and it was just me and in the editing room with Tom Cross and Damien. And, and by that point I had a sense of how logic worked. So I was able to 
create my own demos um, that were at least good enough to put into the movie. But those pre-production demos, those were made by that team based on the orchestrations, and they were really good. They were really polished. Um, they, they're they really good at making um, lifelike mock-ups. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, we were getting the songs written, um, making demos, bringing singers in, trying to build build um demos for playback for playback on set um we knew that some of the songs would be would be playback songs would be just be blasted on the freeway or blasted uh at the on the the hill where they're dancing whereas other songs would be sung live like audition the fools who dream the city of stars duet we knew those were going to be played live on set sung live on set but um some of them we we did knew needed to be demos um as well as other sort of instrumental segments of the movie like the epilogue like planetarium those also needed demos so we were just sort of making those um and then there was also the uh phase of um figuring out all the jazz all the instrumental music you know when they go to the club and they're talking about he's he's um you know pointing out what he loves about jazz or whether they're dancing there's this sort of um summer montage thing that turns into them at the club and they're dancing and the camera's whipping whip panning back and forth between him at the piano and her dancing and all of those needed to be figured out so those were also pre-records so um those were things that again um i I charted and we actually had pre-record sessions for those. So we went into Conway, which is one of the smaller studios and we had our jazz combo, all these great, great, um, players here in LA. And we recorded, um, versions of those. And then, um, we wanted, we wanted it to look really right on screen. We didn't want it to look like people were just faking it. Um, you, you see that a lot in movies. So, um, so then I transcribed all of the solos, all of the walking bass lines, everything. Um, some of it had been on the page because, you know, jazz, some of it is like the head is sometimes on the page, but then there are solo sections and then maybe it returns to the head. Or even during during the head, you know, certain players have their parts written, but certain players, like we talked about with the Bratislava Symphony, certain players just have changes that they have to improvise to. Um, also the drums, like the drums are going to do anything they want. Like yeah. all of that... Um, so I, I transcribed all of that, I, the exact drum parts, um, where every little snare hit was, every little cymbal did hit. Did you transcribe with a pen and a staff paper pad, or did you tr- dump it into Finale? No, I, I used in Finale. But anyway, so we got it on the page so that they could all have their parts and they could all play. We could try to get it as close as possible yeah. on screen. So then we were all on set. I was on set. Um along with the music team, um, Damien, of course, and we were all just sort of like paying really close attention to, to make sure that at least when anybody was on camera that they were picking up exactly what was recorded to. And we tried to get as close as possible, but then, of course, you don't get it, you don't get it right. Um, people don't catch all the, all the cymbal hits or the, the hi-hats doing the wrong thing or the bass players going up the neck when you should be going down the neck. And so we got to post-production and we decided we needed to fix all that. So then we go and do extra sessions where we, we sort of punch in and try to fix as much as possible. And I remember some of the most fun challenges were actually having to write new parts to fit what was going on on screen. Um, Cause like there was one, there was one shot where um, uh, me and Sebastian had just finished their the dancing and piano thing, and they got off screen, and then a new pianist, um, who was Randy Kerber, who's actually the session one, you know, like the and great, one the of great the greatest piano player. players on the planet. So he was the on screen musician, and he stepped up and started. It was a playback of jazz we'd recorded, and the band on screen, they they had their parts transcribed, and they knew what they were doing, and we used it, but like. In the edit later on, a few months later, uh, Tom and Damien had to roll a shot. Like they had to move the sink on something. So the pianist, so Randy's hands were had no longer even close to what the wow. pre recorded hmm. jazz was. So I remember one of the fun, most fun puzzles of post production was having to watch the hands <laughs> and write a new part that was totally written, but that would sound just like comping, that would ma- match the same sort of syncopated rhythms that were on screen, but be new and then go into the studio and say 
this is weird. It's a it's a weird written version. And also the syncopation was like all shifted, so it was just strange, but that's what was on screen. And it was musical enough that it, it could work sonically, um, but it's what was on screen, so we had to do it. And um, and he played that part, and and that's so. There, so it's there were, just yeah. unbelievable the <laughs> level of detail for the instrumental aspects, which of course I love that you spent that much care and love on it, because often that's uh, an attended to for singers. You know, making yeah. sure their mouth moves appropriately. And when you said. You know, for example, when she sings uh, Those Who Dream yeah. live, did Emma yeah. pre-record her vocals and have an earwig in and lip sync? Did she sing live? Did she do both, which is you get a singer to sing live along with a playback and then you kind of mix and match? So we had it pre-recorded just to have it, just to... With her voice. With her voice, but that's not what we ended up using. What we ended up using was... Um, I was in the other room on a piano playing into her ear. And so it was just a, it was a real performance in front of the camera. We were, it was like a recital, you know, she was singing in her own time and I was accompanying her and I was letting her push it sometimes. Other times I was trying to push the pace. We were just sort of playing off of each other. Um, I was mostly following her, but sometimes trying to push it. And, um, and it was a real authentic performance in front of the camera. And, um, we knew that it, there there's nothing like that you know even with the best lip syncing the nuance it's you don't capture the nuance of it the every little gulp every little smack of the lips every little um if if that's real being captured real in front of the camera there's it, there's nothing like it so that's how we wanted to do it um and yeah in terms of like coaching the the singing that's that's where uh that's where like Marius is is uh, that's his kind of more his forte he's so good with working with singers so um he was he and Steve were at the monitors and and trying to watch the performance and and um and talk about how wide the mouth is open and how those things um while I was just focusing on playing the right notes I was very very nervous too um hmm. because I think we did like six takes of it of an audition and Emma was really nervous. It was her big uh, musical performance moment. And, um, you know, we'd all worked on a lot in the studio, but this is, there's no safety net now. You're doing it live. You couldn't do in post. You couldn't tune her or replace a line. It wasn't isolated enough vocally that she, because usually that's part of the biggest issue is that you get an actor to sing and they're not Ella Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. And so you have to, fix and tune and that's okay i mean i've done that and certainly nobody should feel shy about it but that was all live it was all live yeah she's a great singer yeah she she is and um it was it also wasn't as isolated as it as it could have been i mean Mm. the sound team did a did an incredible job on that but there were just things that come up that you don't plan for like it's all in one shot that's another thing that makes it so intimidating is it's all in one shot so you can't there's no cut, cutaways cut yeah. between we'll use this piece of that and that piece of that it had to be one performance one sung performance all the way straight through so so anyway that's part of why i was so nervous because i was like if i miss a note and i derail her she's only got so many takes like she's gonna start losing her voice after yeah. two three four or five takes i think we got six out of it but um you know the ideal takes are maybe the second or the third um and um and i was just so nervous about if i screw up then um, I'm going to ruin a take. So I was I was very nervous, and um, but like I was saying with the sound, um, sound team did an incredible job. But there are things you just don't plan for, like um, the shot. The camera starts behind the desk, and you have the director and the casting director there. And then um, there's this um, the desk splits. It was like a mm. stunt desk where the desk would pull apart so that the camera could move through the desk, mm. and the actors would just scurry out of the way. But all of that is very loud yes. uh, you know have a, a mechanical desk uh, uh you know d- d- uh, disconnecting and you have actors moving and all of that and that all had a lot of noise and um so the sound team and um sound editors later um millie um they had to go and do all sorts of like I don't know isotope fixing of removing. It's magical removing sounds. Yeah. Um, it sounds like you guys had a connection 
again, similar to how composers are rarely on set or never on set, you were really making connections with the actors, which a lot of the composers have no no connection to during a movie process. Did you spend a lot of time with Emma and Ryan on the movie, just talking over things and working with them, practicing and stuff like that? Yeah, there were, there was a lot of um, during pre production, and then for part of the shoot, there was a lot of working in the studio on the songs, um, just uh, having them learn the songs, having them feel comfortable with the songs, getting their feedback. There were certain songs where um, they had really strong opinions on certain things about them. Um, it was more the lyric at that time, so it ended up being more of a an issue for Pasig and Paul, but like the, the duet on the hill, they, they – um, they wanted a whole new lyric on that one. So hmm. had to wow. throw, throw that back to Pascal and Paul and they had to rewrite that. Um, there were other things where you just figure out, especially like just simple things like keys, which key sounds good in a voice. Like it takes a while to figure that out. And especially on duets, it, it, it can be an issue because you have a key that's perfect for Ryan's voice, but it's not right for Emma's voice. So you, you find, well, this key's um, going to be too high or too low for this one player. So, either have to negotiate that and find a key that's good enough for both, which we did in some cases, like the City of Stars duet. I remember up until literally a couple of minutes before we went down to perform it. So we were on set, like the same deal where I was on the piano, they had earwigs, and I was playing along with them, and they were singing, and I was just accompanying them. But up until a couple minutes before we shot that, we were up in the dressing room and where we had another piano, just a practice piano, and we were, we were still negotiating the key, and and you know Ryan was saying, well, this key's I'd really like to this key's best for my voice, and this key, but but then it's too high for Emma, and then so we, you know, so um, we were we were f- making a compromise on on the key up until a couple of minutes before we shot that, and then there are other ones where we had figured it out in the studio, and there was a negotiation like with the the duet on the hill, a lovely night. Again, there was a key that was good for Ryan, there's a key that was good for Emma, and and I and. I decided the best thing to do was just put a key change between their verses. Nice. <laughs> so there's there's a little four bar just key change where um, um, That's Ra- remarkable. Ryan sings in his key. There's a little key change. Emma sings the verse in her key, uh, verse and chorus, I guess. And then the the instrumental dance break is what it is. It doesn't really matter at that yeah. point. I had to. I had to. I remember I had to re- reorchestrate it because again, it was this is in that pre production phase where. Um, I would do it in finale first before the mock-up. So I remember <laughs> I was being lazy. I mean, I remember we made that we made that agreement about it. it'll be in this key, it'll be a key change in that key. And I knew the implications. I knew, oh, the, like the thing moved like a fifth, which is pretty big. It's Huge. like a, gonna have to reconfigure a lot of voicings and a lot of stuff. And um, so I remember thinking, oh, I. I Almost, I wish they wouldn't pick that option, but if that's what they need to do, then I'm going to have to, the whole several minutes of dancing has to be reorchestrated. So I just sort of had to suck it up and, and do it. But. You have this great partnership with Damien. At what point did you start knowing about First Man or looking into the process of, of what that score was going to be? Yeah, so, well, the first time I read it when we were still working on La La Land, I didn't have any musical ideas. We didn't talk about the music. He just wanted me to see what the story was and see what it was. Um, and then we went back to work on La La Land. And then the second draft I read was, yeah, in the spring um, of 17. And that's when Damien and I started talking about what it should sound like. And we talked about, um, he, he suggested theremin. Um, we talked about other ways to mix some vintage modular synths in with an orchestra we talked about how maybe we could uh you know mess with an orchestra a little bit so we could find some some ways to um you know manipulate orchestral sounds so that's where we just started playing around and i got a theremin i got some other synths um and started playing around with by the by this point Having gone through La La Land, like I said, during the post phase, during the actual scoring part of La La Land, I learned how to use Logic. Um, so I just started to get deeper into it, just mess around with um, plugins, and and then start to think about how could how could we, some of these plugins, how could we do them in the analog world? Um, so like we we found we really liked the sound of um, strings that had gone through a rotor cabinet. Um, and then, so so then we figured that out in the plug in, plug in world, and then started planning for later 
had to do that in the real world, which is really fun, like recording all the strings separately, even in the actual sections, the first violins, the second violins, the violas, cellos, basses separately, and then pipe them through a Leslie rotor cabinet in the room and put the cabinet at the place in the room where those sections would be so mm. that you can get the image of it right. Mm. So we'd move it, you know, we'd have it off to the left where the first violins are, and then we would... Um, move it a little bit further where the seconds are and then, you know, around the room and, and, and get the cabinet in the right part of the room and pipe all the strings through it. So, um, that was a couple of years. That was like a year and a half later after we'd actually recorded, but it was during that spring where we were just playing around with software and ideas where we started to come up with sonic ideas, um, of, of, for what it could, what the score could sound like. So yeah, it was just a lot of playing around. We did, we really didn't know what, what we wanted and Damien didn't know either. And that was, that was a kind of a new thing for us. Um, because for La La Land, uh, we had really good, uh, references in mind. We had scores. We loved French new wave scores. We loved American musicals, all sorts of things. And we just sort of had good ideas for things to draw on in terms of the orchestral language. Um, but for first man, Damien was the first to say, he's like, I have no idea what this is going to be. It may be Gregorian chant. It may be electronic. I have no idea. So, um, Did the time period and like the fact that Neil Armstrong is a real person have any impact on your decision making for the sounds um, that you chose? A little bit. Um, I think the reason – this wasn't really part of my thinking, but the part of the reason he thought of theremin in the first place was because Neil was a fan of the theremin. Um, hmm. That's not, I guess, really a good reason to use in a score, but that's where the idea came from. And it was really once we put our melody on it and we saw how emotionally... Um, how and a, a theremin uh, is for people who, who don't know. It's like a, it's like a synth, but you, it, it, you, don't, you play it by waving your hands at it. It has these electromagnetic fields and it has one antenna for pitch and one for volume. And you just wave your hands at these two pitch and volume. And it's, it's, it's kind of like... It sounds a little bit like singing or... Well, it's famous in a couple tracks that people would know. Um, and in Good Vibrations yeah. by the Beach Boys, that's a theremin. It's a funny kind of 50s yeah. uh, well, that's, science fiction sound. Well, that's the, that's, that's the thing. You, you call it a funny... It's, it's funny, campy, we associate with science fiction. And... We wanted to. We were. We knew that, and we wanted to try to, um, oh, like purposefully avoid those connotations, mm. um, because we didn't want the score to sound camp. We wanted to. So when Damien said try a theremin, he said, "Let's see if if we put our melody on it, can it be really heartbreaking? Can it be really emotional?" Nice. So we tried to use it more like you would use a solo voice, or sure. like you would use a solo violin in, yeah. in a very like emotive way. And I found the theremin does that really well. You know, you give every any note a vibrato. You can every note you can sort of slide into it, slide out of it. It's it's. It, you could, did you play it? Yeah, or I did. did. you hire a theremin? No, I played player? it. And that's amazing. You can. There's a whole technique where you sit in front of it and you yeah. have to get your hands. My technique do. is terrible. Uh, I never learned the real technique where you kind of have these very fine finger positions. I just sort of wave my whole hand at it. Yeah. Um, but I did take after take after take until I got it right. Um, and question, but, tech yeah. question: Do you record a theremin direct, or do you put microphones and record? in the room that's a great question so i started when i first got it i was playing it into a, just a practice amp just so i could um it was actually at my parents house when i first got it where is that wisconsin nice so i um i i took it with me to wisconsin and i got like this tiny tiny practice amp from guitar center and i was playing it into that and making demos and i was using like a usb mic to, to mic just just to show damien just to make demos for him and and I knew later on I would I would record it directly, um, and then later on once I got to working on the actual score, um, I was recording it um, through a, through a Neve a preamp, so making a a nice. It was you know the Neve would add just a little bit of extra color to it, hmm. um, but but there was this one demo. There's this cue moonwalk in the movie which um, Damien really fell in love with as a demo, and there were a bunch of demos where he he just he used them in the edit. He just, he, he wanted to sort of, you, um, slot them in as they were editing. And it was, I had made that in Wisconsin and I'd made it 
not a good recording. It was a USB mic in front of a terrible practice amp, and so there was just a very different quality to the to the theremin. Um, and then I had to extend that cue. I had to add on to it, um, which I did um, in LA with the like recording it direct with good equipment. And then so when we got to mixing it, like one of the biggest challenges was having to um, having to actually make the degrade the quality and add the <laughs> fuzz and EQ it and make it actually match the really bad USB practice. Amp. How do I make the sound bad? E- exactly. <laughs> or at least ma- yeah, sound the same um, so that so that the extended, the extra notes would fit with the notes that were there. It's also interesting that Demo Love has its place in everybody's creative yeah. process. Yeah. Um, it's just sometimes you cannot get, you can't beat a demo. Yeah. You just can't. Yeah. But anyway, what you're saying about why we chose the theremin. So Damien chose it because, or I guess, uh, to your question, um, it had a, it had a place in, in Neil's life, but, um, what ultimately, uh, made us choose it is, is, is what it felt like and, and how heartbreaking it could be because what it ended up sort of becoming was like the voice of Neil's inner pain. Mm. Um, it was almost Neil's a very, um, restrained character he doesn't you know doesn't you see that in the give, film doesn't give a lot yep. and um and he's very um stoic and um but he has this inner you know the family deals with this very very terrible tragedy and they and some other losses along the way so there's this real real pain that he's working through and living through as he's as he's working towards this sort of historic mission and and that we found the theremin could kind of be the sound of that 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 heartbreak coming out so we keep it we try to keep it pretty contained early on in the movie and then as as later on in the movie as as the apollo 11 mission starts we let the theremin start peeking out and when he gets to the moon then it's it really becomes like the soloist of the score and it starts singing and Hmm. um and 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 we, we thought that that was um sort of what the thing to do with it to let it be that um expressive expressive yeah. that that inner the his his inner inner um pain there seems to be and i don't know whether it was in a something that you did on purpose or whether it's just these images called this to mind the waltz the docking waltz mm-hmm. is it referential to yeah. 2001 yeah okay because i said i don't know maybe justin you know sees pictures of no of things in space and it feels like <laughs> No, yeah. no. Damien wanted a. He described it as a ballet between the Agena and the Gemini, and he wanted it to very, you know, obviously reference 2001 and also classical pieces um, like um, some of Offenbach, yeah. um, which we've played with before. I mean, like the the Barcarolle is. Um, has been an inspiration for yeah. Lal, like a, you know, part of some of the Lala Land score. It's, this is it's, such a beautiful piece of music. It Thank really you. is. I really. As soon love as, it. when I was watching the movie, the, as soon as it came on, I was like, you start like moving in the seat. <laughs> is this a result of your being able to write this, your education in classical music that you knew where to turn orchestrally? referentially uh, because you know you, you're doing all this incredibly authentic jazz not a lot of people have both those backgrounds I don't have a jazz background you fooled me I I have I grew up playing classical piano and listening to orchestral music mostly as a kid film scores some but more orchestral music than anything I guess um and I and I I had to sort of learn um, the you know jazz um, as Language. the base the basics yeah. um, for Damien's movies um, and uh, and yeah so something like this this was it's it was authentic. fun well thank you it's it's it, one of my favorite parts of um, scoring is um, we love thematic scores we love. Um, scores that have a few themes that kind of mean certain things in the movie and and then twisting those themes in other ways and and reharmonizing and um 
Um, so this was the, it's it's the Karen melody. It's the main theme. It's the it's the theme the theme that you know it it blasts um, in the moon landing when we cut to the wide shot of the moon. Except there, it's it's in minor, and here it's been reharmonized to yeah. be a nice sort of major waltz. Um, and I love doing that. Is is like figuring out how to t- twist a theme to sort of fit in to be something else. So um, yeah. So when Damien asked for a ballet based on these classical pieces of music, I I just sat down and, and thought, okay, well, with our melody, how can it be reharmonized? And then given that. Now, is it in can, three mm-hmm. initially? Mm-hmm. The Karen's theme. Um, yeah. Or did you have to figure out a way to take a well, something that is in a different meter and move it into three? Um, it's it's not so when it's first played, it's more rubato. So it's mm. it's um, it's actually I, if if I I think I I I um I would chart it in four originally and then um. And then when it's played in the moon landing, that's it's more of like a bum 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 bum. It's more of like a twelve. Yeah. Um, although actually, the way I charted it there, One, two, 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 three, yeah. Three, two, three, four, actually, the way I charted it was in four with triplets for this piece, um, which is questionable. <laughs> Maybe the wrong choice. Um, it works. It, it, yeah, no, it, it it works. It just it caused it caused me some problems in terms of how certain things looked on the page. Um, I maybe should have done twelve, but it, that was charted in four with triplets. Um, it's heroic. Thank you. No, it would have sa- it would have sounded the same. It's just yeah. sort of how it how it how yeah. it looks. But um, it's but yeah, it, it is definitely a, a completely different pulse for the for the waltz. Had to had to think of it in a true three. Um, Although I think it's in six, I think I, I did the waltz in six, but it's, it's still the same. It feels like a it sure. feels like a real three. As we wrap up, uh, just wanted to ask if is there anything you're working on, anything you're excited about uh, in the future that you can talk about? Um, I mean, at, right now um, I'm figuring the next uh, thing I'll score is, is Damien's next movie. I, I I think I'm probably gonna get going on it with him sometime in the summer. Um, I have this window um, before then to score something else, but I don't have a project. Um, we're going to actually, Kenny and I, after you leave today, we're going to write and shoot a movie. Yeah, real quick. <laughs> really quickly, just so we can take advantage of One of those iPhone bit. movies. Yeah. Uh, it's take, worked before. It's a, we're going to take advantage of that availability, because wouldn't it be great to have Justin score a movie for anybody? Because your work's great, man. I'm so, I'm so proud, and I'm... I'm really feeling very good about being completely snarky and critical. The first thing he sent me. And oh, saying, you needed to beat me up. Everybody needs to be beaten up. I, mean, um, that's how we I don't know what to do. And what There's not a to gentle do. way to say it. I don't know. If I, saying, you pro- you <laughs> Maybe we nev- can write that biopic. Never send this. <laughs> we got to do that biopic on your band. There's there's some yeah. storylines there. Just the French. Yeah. yeah. Well, that'll be done. Knowing yeah. Da, that'll be done. <laughs> Justin, it's been amazing. Just Congrats great. on all your success yeah, and, so and super. best thank of you. luck with the future of every project you're working on. Uh, we want to thank you for joining Score the Podcast. A reminder to our listeners to rate and review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts if you like what you're hearing. Justin, it's been great. It's been fun for me. And needless to say, I have a nice little pride, pride, prideful feeling having known you since that first MIDI demo and <laughs> seeing you in your tuxedo winning those awards. Thanks so much for coming, Kenny. It's been fun. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for having me.